Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Lizette Garcia, and I am the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer here at HACER. Welcome to the Current Environments for Directors and Considerations for the Future. I hope that you've been enjoying today's sessions so far and are looking forward to our next speaker, NACD faculty member Paula Chumley. Paul is here to give us a, a conversation on uh, what is happening in the world of directors and what you need to be thinking about. And uh, Paula, in just a moment, will uh, I'll introduce you. There she is. Hey, Paula. Um, would like for you all to know that this is going to be an interactive session. She is going to be talking, but also would like to field the questions that you have um, about the different topics that she will be addressing. And so um, you can use the Q&A box feature to enter your questions, and then the team will be sharing those with Paula. And we will try and address as many of those as possible towards the end of the session when Q&A starts. So a little bit about Paula. She is currently the CEO of the Sorrell Group, an organization that provides governance, training, and education for first-time corporate board directors. She also serves in, on the board of directors for the Bank of the Ozarks, Terex Corporation, and Nationwide Mutual Funds. In her spare time, believe it or not, she has some and she uses it for service. Paula chairs the Executive Leadership Councils, Hacer's sister organization in the African American community, um, their corporate board initiative, which works to train and place diverse directors. So please welcome Paula to our session today. Well, thank you. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. And I want to start out, first of all, by thanking Hacer for inviting NACD and myself to discuss some of the current topics which are actually facing uh, corporate directors. So why don't we move on and get started. Um, in the time that we have this afternoon, I want to share with you an update on the topics which are happening today, right now, uh, in America's corporate boardrooms. Boards have been leading their companies into rapidly adapting to the new business environment caused by COVID-19 and COVID-19 managed to bring with it a recession. And then because of the social unrest which is going on in the country, there's also an increased focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. But one of the things about this particular business cycle that is different than other issues we faced in the past is the level of uncertainty. We have seen whole industries from healthcare to retail to banking to technology, and they're all being restructured with lightning speed. And of course, with these rapid changes in strategy and the strategic environment, the landscape for risk, which the boards are charged with overseeing, also is changing. So I'm gonna pause at the end of every topic and just remind you to put your questions in the chat box. And then at the end, we'll try to make sure we have enough time to cover all of them. So moving on. In January of 2020, the beginning of this year, this was a list of all of the key topics that boards were focused on. Activists were pushing boards to reduce tenure director, the tenureship of directors, and they were also pushing us to change board composition. The Securities and Exchange Commission was asking for more disclosure about strategy, more disclosure about risk, and especially cyber risk and how that impacted each of our companies. Pay for performance, and executive compensation were still key topics that the board was very focused on. And environmental sustainability and governance is an increasing area of focus for boards in their disclosure. And what most companies have been struggling with is there are seven to eight different measurement systems that are out there. And so which one does each company pick in order to disclose their ESG metrics? within their 10K. 
Also very important is that the demographics of the world are changing. And there's a looming battle for talent. And there are large numbers of vacancies. There's unfilled job opportunities from welders to IT technicians. And in the boardroom, we are being asked to disclose more and more how our corporations engage with our human talent. And I'll talk a little bit later on about shareholder engagement. So let's move on. At the end of the first quarter earnings, um, most corporations in the US had a month and a half of business as usual and a month and a half during that first quarter where everything in the world changed and we were all focused on making major changes in our organization. So to give you an example, if we move on, next slide. In March, overnight, I watched one of my boards manage the process from shutting down its facilities in China to shutting down its facilities in Italy to shutting down its facilities in the United States. On the other hand, another one of my boards, which is in financial service, had their software engineers working 24 seven to develop new programs so that they could handle the government approved PPP program and the onslaught of applications which came with it. At the same time in this environment, at the end of the first quarter, you had some companies that could not keep up with the demand for their products. So most of us that were on boards were doing weekly board calls that involved not only the CEO, but much of the management team, because we needed on the spot immediate information about what was happening within the business. During the second and third quarter, that communication process has settled down. So we went from weekly meetings to monthly meetings that only involve the CEO. And we're now at a place where we're getting monthly emails and letters from the CEO as they get their hands around all of the business challenges that they are facing trying to restart their operations. In the meantime, everyone is working harder from home and companies are having to start thinking about work from home fatigue, which is a new business environment issue that companies have to deal with and they're updating the board. So a constant discussion going on in the boardroom is what has to change. We are reworking our board agendas so that we are focused on the critical few. And as the last point on this slide makes, one of the things that is a constant challenge is to make sure that we help the corporations not only deal with the short-term issues they're having right now, but making sure that we're not making any decisions today, reacting too quickly, and in some way mortgaging the long-term futures of our companies. So moving on, one of the ways that boards add value is that if management is focused on the trees, the board is focused on the forest. We still have the responsibility for overseeing performance for the current quarter, but we on the board are also challenged with stepping away from the day-to-day -day details and asking, are we treating our employees, our vendors, our partners in line with the company's values as we go through the volatility that's going on within the marketplace today? So boards are charged with some tough decisions in this environment. We're charged with remembering that our fiduciary duty is to the entity as a whole and to its survival. And while this has all been going on, the Securities and Exchange Commission has increased um, the areas in which they would like to see boards and companies have greater disclosure um, 
about what's going on within the organization. So some new topics that we have to expand our disclosure on lie in ESG. They lie in talent and human resource management, and they lie in the risk area. And I'll talk about the risk area a little bit more later on. So moving on, one of the key topics that has risen to the top of the board's agenda. Mainly, um, it, it's always been a board item, but unfortunately, it has been something that the board has dealt with on a periodic basis. Now, diversity, equity, and inclusion is something which is being talked about at every single board meeting, driven by the social unrest that is going on within the country. And we're talking about it not only in terms of how it affects the boardroom, but how does diversity, equity, inclusion affect the whole organization, starting with the board all the way down to entry level jobs. And because this is a culture issue, the board always starts with tone at the top. So let's look at some of the specific things. Diversity is not an HR issue. It's a business issue. It's a resource issue. And as America shifts more from a manufacturing to a service-based economy, it becomes even more and more important. People operate companies and people are the ones in, to make sure that their companies are taking advantage of all of the competitive advantages that they can. And there's study after study after study, which shows that diverse companies, companies with diverse teams outperform companies that don't have diverse teams. So diversity, equity, inclusion has to start with the board. Board members have to make sure that it is a measurable objective on the part of the CEO. Another thing I would point out is that Boards become very much, lots of times, the keeper, keepers of the culture of the company because the average CEO today serves as a CEO for five to seven years. The average board member serves on a board for seven to 10 years. And so it's important, and I know HACR has various programs not only like, e like ELC designed to increase the number of uh, racially diverse members within the boardroom, but just as important to make sure that the talent pipeline and that the talent bench is there as more and more boardrooms begin to open up. Now, the Rooney rule has been around for quite a while, but I personally find it a rule I'm very uh, disappointed in. I don't think the Rooney rule has actually changed the composition of America's boardrooms. So a new reframe or a new process that is emerging um, is one that a colleague of mine who runs a recruiting firm says, interview the diverse talent first. No matter which position, whether it's entry level or it's in the boardroom, interview the diverse talent first. And in most instances, it is those folks who are first interviewed who become the benchmark. And if you are first in the interview line, it helps to ensure that you may be first to be chosen. And so I would ask you in your own organizations, is this something that you all can get them to practice where they can always interview the diverse talent first across the organization? Okay. Next. So the golden rule in business is what gets measured gets done. Melody Hobson, who's the co-CEO of Ariel Capital, coined this phrase, the three Ps, long before today's cultural unrest. Measure what, what we say or trying to do in the boardrooms is that if we measure what we are doing with our people, we are measuring where the company is making its purchases from and who its suppliers are. 
And we also have oversight over where the company is spending its philanthropic dollars. Then we have oversight over whether the company is actually living its values in each one of these areas. So I want to suggest that each of you ask your own companies where are they spending their dollars in sourcing? This is another area where Hasir has um, a program, but are they spending their dollars with Hispanic business? Are we getting, are you getting your fair share of corporate dollars? Um, where are the uh, bank deposits of your companies going? Are they going into women owned and women led banks? And how much does the giving program of the companies that we each work for or lead, how much does that reflect the demographics of our employees, our customers, and our suppliers? So es &G today has become a hot topic because COVID is now classified as an environmental issue and so more and more boards are being asked to divulge and disclose what they are doing in the people, the purchasing, the philanthropy, and the environmental area. So if you have questions, let's turn to what the CEO has to do in this process. Can we change the slide? So, it's very important what boardrooms are working on today is how do we take diversity, equity, and inclusion and make it something which is measurable so that it can be built into the compensation plan for the um, CEO and his team. On one of the boards I, I'm on, we actually have both short-term and long-term goals for our CEO about moving both racially diverse and women into the executive ranks. And a certain portion of his incentive comp every year is based on this measurement. So the board has to come up with goals and each one of our companies have to come up with goals that make sense for your particular company and your particular industry. Some other things which are showing up today in diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, the tech companies are being asked to disclose pay equity. Um, we're moving from a discussion of pay equity to something they call comparable pay. So it's not just uh, adding up or comparing the males in a position to the women in a position, but how do you compare positions themselves across organizations in order to make sure that um, we're getting equal pay for equal work. Now, one of the hardest things to measure for compensation plans is equity and inclusion. But here again, if CEOs, and I'm doing this with all of my companies, do we have employee engagement surveys? because employee engagement surveys give you numbers and measurements which can be built into a plan and which can be tracked over a number of years. So cultural surveys can point to areas where companies and organizations need to have more candid discussions in smaller groups. So the board plays a leadership role by ensuring that the CEO is leading the company's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, efforts. And an example of that is that I'm on a board where one of my colleagues is a Native American and we are actually doing a fireside chat with the CEO, which will be broadcast to all of the thousands of employees that we have, basically talking about what the various initiatives are that the organization has and also talking about where we are on our journey. And it's just a small example of what an involved board member can actually do to try to keep the diversity, equity, and inclusion topic at the forefront of the board's agenda. So let me leave you with some questions that you can ask 
and you can ask these questions all up and down the organization. These are questions that will help to remind each one of our organizations where we are on the diversity um, journey. It's helpful, especially those who are in HACER who are in senior management. If you ask whether or not there are clear targets and incentives, whether anything is included in the compensation program, are you getting a clear answer um, to those? Does your organization have an employee engagement survey where inclusion um, is actually used to it's quantified in some way, and the CEO is charged with moving the numbers. So moving on. So if you have any questions on diversity, equity, and inclusion, please put them into the chat box, and I'll circle back to them at the end um, and make sure we try to answer them all. So now let's talk about how the current environment has created a change in the oversight that the board has over the company's strategy. So moving on to the next slide, one of the major changes is in boardrooms today is the level of what I would call board engagement. Um, because there's so much volatility in the business environment right now, boards are asking for more and more information. Boards are asking to talk about strategic topics at almost every single meeting. And they're not just asking for information which is deeper on the same topics. They're also asking for more information on emerging topics because um, the volatility that we have in the marketplace right now is exposing a lot of weaknesses and also a lot of opportunities for corporate boards. So here's a summary of some of the areas that are affecting every company's strategies. So think about the customers in your own organizations. Customer behaviors, customer preferences are requiring constant updating and constant recalibrating because of the uncertainty in the economy. And so boards are asking for a constant recalibration of some of the trends that we use as the basis for the decisions. Other things that are happening right now is some competitors are expanding other competitors are contracting. So the competitive landscape that we deal with in strategies are changing. Some companies are using this downturn to accelerate technological shifts in their companies in anticipation that when the economy rebounds, they'll have a leg up. And some companies are out there struggling with the issue of what does expansion and growth mean in this environment, given the political and legislative uncertainties. And one of the things that each of you knows is companies can do great if everybody has a level playing field, but if you don't know what the landscape is gonna look like tomorrow, it's very, very difficult for companies to do long-term plans. So boards are making some hard decisions, which is do we just choose to expand within the domestic market or do we in fact go ahead and expand our operations internationally and take a chance on terms of what the world economy is going to look like in two to three years. So if we move on. So this recession and COVID-19 has also caused all of the boards to rethink what the time horizon is. Um, for those of you in the audience who went to business school, um, we were all taught that strategic plans should be over five year horizons and we ought to do them using Porter's five forces. Um, doing strategic plans over five years is no longer a time horizon that makes sense um, when there's such unknown volatility within the market. 
And so a lot of companies today are shrinking the time horizon based on their industry. And they really are focused on what's our business going to look like in the next two years and should we be reprioritizing any of the investments and stuff that we're making now because we need to only focus on those that can show up and produce results within two to three years and longer term opportunities are quite frankly being shelved in a lot of companies so if we move on in the past um, corporate boards were very much the recipient of the strategy that management had developed. In this environment, and for the last couple of years, um, NACD puts out every year a Blue Ribbon Commission report, and in their last Blue Ribbon Commission report, it was called Adaptive governments, Governance. And one of the things that they said was that the environment, the pace of change within the environment had become so rapid that boards needed to move um, from being just the recipients of the strategy that management proposed to having a much more engaged discussion. So boards today expect that their management teams are going to discuss with them alternatives for how the company can go forward and grow. And they want those discussions to take place upfront long before management has focused on just one strategy. So a key question that you'll hear in today's boardrooms that we give to management is tell me what alternatives you considered and rejected and tell me why you rejected them. And then when we dive into the strategy that in fact is presented, another key question that we ask is, what assumptions are critical to the success of the strategy that you are recommending? What we want is for the board to have a deeper understanding of what the thinking of management is and so today, boards expect to be involved in talking about strategic topics all year long. So let me stop here on strategy and once again say, if you have any questions in this area, please put them in the chat box. And I want to move on to the discussion of risk. So the other side of strategy is risk. And so if our business environment is changing so much, then boards today are reprioritizing how those risks have changed. And I want to pause here. Um, one of the things that they wanted us to talk about was shareholder communications and how shareholder communications have changed. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission on August 20th put out a brand new set of guidelines for something they call reg sk it is the guidelines that that provide the umbrella for what companies are supposed to disclose to their shareholders and this is a set of guidelines that have not been updated or revised in 30 years it's also a set of guidelines that are highly prescriptive. This new set of regulations, which just came out, um, is shifting and saying that companies now have more flexibility to talk about their business in their public documents in a time horizon that fits their particular industry. So if you're in tech, you may only be talking about your environment for the next two to three years, where if you're in construction, you may be talking about your business environment for the next eight years. So they're giving companies more of that flexibility. Another thing that they have introduced in these new set of guidelines is a desire to have uh, companies share more of what's going on in their human resources area. They want more conversation about talent, talent development, succession planning. They want to add all of those things to the conversation. 
One of the major areas, though, that they have asked for changes in is in risk. Today, in a 10K, you're required to just list all the risks that a business faces, and most companies list them in alphabetical order, sort of. So if we move to the next slide, what the SEC is asking is that today, boards disclose more what are the risks to their strategy and how are they changing their strategy in regards to the risk? And one of the things that is absolutely brand new is for the first time boards are being asked to make sure that their companies list their risk in priority order. This is going to be a very interesting exercise for boards to go through of the five to 10 to 12 pages of risks that get listed in a 10K. All of a sudden now, we have to support management in going through a rank ordering process so that what we are disclosing to shareholders is what we think all of the risks are in priority order so that we make the thinking that's going on in the board more transparent um, to customers. So if we move on, I mean to shareholders. So because of that, in the financial field, you often have risk committees on the board. But for most boards outside of the financial field, risk is just discussed at the total board. This is changing. Um, more and more boards are being asked to disclose or talk about the risk landscape. Um, and so what has happened in the boardroom is because of that, things like our executive sessions with the CEO that used to maybe take a half an hour in a board meeting are now taking an hour and a half. And that's because there are more and more things on the CEO's mind that he wants to discuss with the board and keep the board abreast of. So he's not only talking to us about how the company is handling the current crisis, he's also talking to us about this environment is making it really clear where the strengths and weaknesses are of the organization. And we in the boardroom are turning around and saying, is there anything we're learning in this environment that is teaching us more about how the organization ought to change its risk appetite? So moving on. So one of the things that CFOs are doing in the risk area is that they're dusting off all of their information from the 2008 crisis and reminding boards of how the company performed when we went through that particular downturn. But one thing that has changed since 2008 is technology. And technology has both introduced a new set of risks and it's also introduced a new set of tools that we can use to monitor and mitigate risk. The other thing that has happened since the 2008 crisis is there are more and more things in our economy that are interrelated and interconnected. And so when we talk about risk or even talk about opportunities, Boards today have to pay closer attention to interrelated issues within the environment. So it's no longer business as usual for boards. All of the issues that were present on that first chart that I showed you in 2018 and 2019, all of those issues are still there. And we have added to them a new set of issues in diversity and inclusion, um, in strategy, in risk, We've added all of those to, um, to this list. And so the world of the corporate director today has just gotten more complicated. And with that, um, I will turn it over for questions. Um, we have a, uh, a question here that's asking um, about, it says, the question about assumptions is a great one to start discovering the strategic risks within the business. Is that an intentional connection the board is making when asking that question? Yes, um, it's an intentional question because 
a weakness that used to exist within the board process is that management would present a strategy, they'd present a series of initiatives. And the only time the board found out, okay, that a key assumption to achieving an initiative was wrong was when the initiative failed. And so boards had started probing now um, and they're trying to get a fuller picture of some of the background assumptions that companies are making so that you know or you have to the best of your ability a sense of whether this particular strategy or this particular initiative has to um, succeed. And I'll give you a case in point from my own experience. I was on a board and we made an and, and management was introducing a new chemical and we made an assumption or they made an assumption in the strategic plan how much business they could get by year um, and so at the end of five years we were going to be great <laughs> but buried in there was a very bad assumption about the rate at which our existing customers would be willing to switch and what they did with the product that was half made with the old chemical and half made with the new chemical and so we could get them to switch but the numbers that we thought were going to be achievable in five years actually took seven or eight years because there was a bad assumption in the strategy about what had to happen in order to get the customer to convert to this new product. So by probing in those, those types of areas, boards get a fuller picture of what management is thinking. So I, I want to go back to something that you said earlier, and actually someone's asked a question about it too. Um, and that is, it says here, it seems like boards are becoming much more active in the actual roadmap and direction of the companies. Is that correct? And isn't that now looking out for both the trees and the forest? Yes and no. <laughs> um, our primary responsibility is the forest, but one of the reasons that you want diversity on boards is because of diversity not only in thinking but also diversity in experience and diversity in backgrounds so on one hand and i'll give you another example in a minute yes boards the, the nacd's mantra used to be noses in fingers out our mantra today is noses in and fingers in if something is not going right <laughs> And so, but on the other hand, board members can bring what I call peripheral vision to a company. Um, there's a board that I worked with for NACD that was in the jewelry business. But one of the people that they had as a board member came out of retail. And so one of the things that he brought to the board were the trends that he was seeing in the retail business that two to three to four years later would actually show up in the jewelry business. So in that regard, yes, the whole board's up at the forest level, but you've got individual board members that are also trying to help with what are the trees gonna look like next season. It's interesting. So um, I'm looking here at a couple other questions that have come in and uh someone uh, would like to know a little bit more about uh, what what drove ESG to be a corporate initiative. Um, where is the interest in that stemming from? ESG basically came about because there are a lot, let me back up a second, there are a lot of initiatives, um, and this is something the Securities and Exchange Commission is actually struggling with. There are a lot of initiatives that are social and in order to implement them, the activists in the social initiative turn to corporations and they basically say, what are you doing about this issue? So ESG, especially the environmental side, started with concerns not just about fossil fuels and oil, but it also started as a cry, for example, with the water activists. We have a lot of industries in the United States that are heavy around the world that are heavy water users. 
And while our oceans are full of salt water, we're running out of fresh water. And so whether it's climate change, it's water, it's fossil fuels, it's recycling, all of those things, activists started asking corporate America, what are you doing about it? Greenhouse gases. Um, you'll see all of the announcements which are coming out. Amazon is going to be carbon neutral by 2040. Okay, so companies realize that they walk a fine line. Um, and this is where I say we struggle with Jay Clayton, who's the chair of the SEC, because he has said that companies need to be very careful which social issues they decide to get active in and make sure that their shareholders understand that that social issue links back to the business. Um, but it basically is a crossover from the general environment and the things that general that society as a whole is concerned about moving into corporate America. You have that with pay equity, with gender pay equity. You have that with diversity. All of these start out as social issues, but because corporations play such a large part in the American economy, all of us are individuals are turning to them and saying, what are you doing about this? Yes, I'm, investor. I'm an investor, but tell me what you're doing about these issues that I care about. So, um, so, so another question that's come in is asking about um, what's the difference or how applicable or how do these things apply when it's a private board versus publicly traded? One of the things that NACD believes very strongly um, is, <laughs> this is my colloquial term, water runs downhill, <laughs> okay? So NACD is a great organization to belong in because they start with a public company survey every year, then they do a private company, then they do a nonprofit company, but they do surveys across the whole full spectrum of boards. And what they find is that best practices migrate, okay? Um, and so one of the companies that I work with for NACD is a third generation private company that is family owned that's about a billion, billion and a half in size. And in order for them to grow from a billion five to two billion or three billion, they have figured out that they need to employ and introduce within the company more best governance practices. Um, as you move from having family members who are CEOs to moving to hiring an outside CEO for the first time, where are you going to get the information about what the appropriate compensation is? Because you may have had one structure for the family member because he was a family member. So now all of a sudden, Public companies have comp consultants, and so a private company will adopt the same practice. And it doesn't matter whether you're public or private, you still have to figure out how to evaluate your outside auditor. And so what NACD has found is that best practice is like water, it rolls down the hill, and it will eventually migrate across all types of boards. Makes sense, right? It makes sense. So I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk maybe, um, rather than talking about boards, talk about um, indiv individuals uh, and your uh, credibility, for example, okay. if something were to happen. So I have this question here and it says, um, can you talk about the impact of your credibility on a corporate board when you have an adverse professional event happen publicly outside of your board service? Does that impact the privilege of continuing to serve on the board? Yes, and I'll tell you why. Because you have to think about what is best for the board that you're on. Um, you have a fiduciary duty. The thing about public board service is that we all serve based on fiduciary duty, which is the highest level, duty of care, duty of loyalty, um, and do no harm, okay? Duty of confidentiality, everything. So you have to 
decide whether something which has happened personally or even something which happens on your job or something which happens on another board does that mean that the other boards that you are on um, you should resign from and it becomes a question of whether or not that incident becomes a distraction for the other boards i remember when the enron scandal occurred we had some folks that were on the enron board but that was not the only board they were on they were on other boards and there was a lot of conversation about those other boards wanted to support them as board members. They put out these statements, you know, we have full confidence in John Jones. But at some point in time in the future, it becomes such a distraction that they, a lot of them eventually resigned from their other boards because you have to say, is this harming the company who had nothing to do with this issue? There are people who um, I'm aware of have had uh, relatives and siblings and other things caught up in various other issues and it can impact their ability to continue to serve, to continue to lead and they make a decision. It's best for me to fulfill my fiduciary duty if I step back and I step away. Deal with this, let it settle down and then I can come back. You know, another thing to point out just to share Sometimes you have CEOs who also resign because it is, the it is for the betterment of the entity. I mean, there's a lot of things which happen and the discussion about what's going on within uh, the CEO's um, life um, becomes a distraction. And at some point in time, boards will agree with CEOs. You may not be 100% at fault for whatever's going on, but the best thing for the entity is for you to leave <laughs> so the organization can move on. So um, we, we have just a few minutes left, about five minutes left um, before we wrap up the session. And I know this isn't necessarily uh, what we've been talking about today, but I hope you'll indulge me given the work that you do professionally with Sorrel Group and also with ELC. Um, you know, if you had maybe two words of wisdom or pieces of advice that you'd share with uh, folks who are aspiring to get on a corporate board, what, what's probably the two most important things that, that you would tell them? Number one, understand where you add most value and to what types of companies. Um, you... A living example of that is I had a conversation yesterday with someone that someone referred to me and they're in the medical field, but they're still working. And so the conversation was, what other areas can your medical knowledge be useful in that doesn't create a conflict for whoever you're working for now? So maybe you join or are interested in a veterinary board, okay? Something where that background would be beneficial. So understand where you add value um, is the first thing. And then the second thing is to study governance. The hardest board position to get is your first board position. Um, and that's basically because existing board members don't want to take the time to educate new board members. So whether it's a course that Haseer offers, a course that NACD offers, that's what you know i do with some individual clients go get educated on corporate governance it has a language of its own you need to be knowledgeable about the rules and regulations and the guidelines if you don't know how to read a financial statement go learn how to read a financial statement so understand where you add value and go be prepared for the opportunity by studying corporate governance I, um, I appreciate the conversation today and I'm happy that we've had this opportunity to chat and for you to also share with us what's happening out there, what the current environment looks like and, 
and also to share those parting words of wisdom. You know, Hacer's mission is partly to increase representation on corporate boards, and you and I both know that those numbers have been struggling not only for the Hispanic community, but also in the African American community and also in the Asian community, and in particular for women of color, right? So we've seen some successes when it comes to uh, increasing the diversity on corporate boards, but women of color seem to be lagging behind. Um, but again, appreciate the conversation today. Thank you for joining us, Paula. And I know I speak for all of us when I say that you've given us a lot, a lot to think about um, and, uh, and to act on as we go back to our companies. Um, for everyone who's in the audience, our next session actually continues this conversation, but from a, a slightly different perspective. It picks up on the latter part of what Paula and I were talking about um, in terms of advice for getting on boards and what the numbers are looking like for, for diverse board members. Um, and we're going to focus specifically on empowering corporate boards through diversity. And it features the, uh, the CEOs of the Alliance for Board Diversity. So for those of you who are not familiar with the the Alliance for Board Diversity, or the ABD. Um, that includes Catalyst, um, the Executive Leadership Council, which we mentioned earlier, of course, Hacer, and Leadership Education for Asian Pacifics, or LEAP, um, and includes a partnership with two other entities, uh, Diversified Search um, and Deloitte. And so the CEOs from each of those companies will be part of our next discussion talking about how we can use diversity to empower the boards and continue to move them forward. So please head back to the auditorium um, to join this conversation and the join link will be available to you starting at 3pm. See you then. <laughs>